Okay, so um, the next thing that we are going to do is to talk about heart rate. And heart rate is actually much easier than stroke volume for most people because this little sticky wicket over here gives people a heck of a lot of trouble. You just have to kind of take it apart and put it back together again multiple times. But heart rate, um, you, you kind of know already how to control your heart rate. Okay, so remember the big picture that we're trying to get to here is looking at two different ways of controlling cardiac output because cardiac output is one of the biggest determinants of pressure. Okay, and then of course pressure is what determines blood flow, pressure and resistance. So here's where we are. We're in the heart rate category. But you guys kind of already know that you can change your heart rate with the autonomic nervous system. And then that there are also some hormones that can change your heart rate. So hormonal control and then the rate of depolarization in pacemaker cells is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. We're going to get to that in just a second. Okay, so um, big picture understanding. Um, so remember, remember, remember that if you are talking about controlling your heart rate through, through your autonomic nervous system, it is the medulla oblongata, um, the brainstem, um, has a couple of regions in the medulla oblongata, one of which will decide subconsciously to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. And one of them will activate your sympathetic nervous system, okay? And depending on whether you um, change parasympathetic or sympathetic innervation, you can impact your heart rate via your autonomic nervous system. So the cardiovascular control systems in the medulla oblongata re regulate cardiac muscle contraction. But let me tell you something. They also do something consistent with the vessels, which is vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So big picture understanding and understand that when I'm talking about nervous system regulation of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, I'm talking about a body-wide or systemic effect. I am not talking about regional paracrine-mediated vasoconstriction and vasodilation. I'm talking about whole body stuff. So let's say I um, uh, get into a car accident and my blood vessels vasodilate and my blood pressure drops and my body is trying to maintain homeostasis. What it is going to do is um, two things to maintain homeostasis. It's going to increase my cardiac output by any way that it can, heart rate, stroke volume but it's also going to do whatever is consistent with my systemic vessels, right? And when it does that, it is going to have the net effect of more vasoconstriction and vasodilation because if you vasodilated systemically, that would drop your pressure again. So the deal is what I need you to think about when you're doing something systemic to the vessels, Never undo what you did at the heart with what you do at the vessels. So if the nervous system is telling the heart to increase, which increases pressure and flow, then you need to do something consistent with the vessels, which is constriction. Because when you're doing systemic constriction, it's more about pressure than about resistance. Now it does impact resistance, but what you're trying to do is you're saying, okay, we have an emergency situation here. We need to change the pressure in the plumbing for the whole system. So again, never when you are doing systemic control of blood flow, never undo what you did at the vessel, what you did at the heart with what you do at the vessels. And I'll reinforce this and we've got some videos as well. So autonomic nervous system control of heart rate. There are cardiovascular control centers in the medulla oblongata, okay? One of those um, is attached to the sympathetic nervous system and one of them is attached to the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, the um, medullary cardiovascular control center that is attached to the sympathetic nervous system is sometimes called the cardioacceleratory center because it's going to increase your heart rate, sympathetic cardioacceleratory center. And what it does is the sympathetic one is going to send the signal down to the thoracic region of your spinal cords because that's how you get to your heart. And then it's going to send a signal up to the SA node and AV node. It's not showing AV node, but it goes there as well. And also to the heart, wall of the heart. But 
um, that doesn't impact the heart rate. So part of the medullary cardiovascular control center goes sympathetic nervous system to SA node and AV node. And then you know this, the sympathetic neurons secrete what neurotransmitter? I know that you know. Sympathetic neurons secrete norepinephrine, okay? And it increases heart rate, but it also increases ventricular contractility. So these two mean since cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, that means that the sympathetic nervous system has a dramatic impact on cardiac output because it kind of hits them at both ways. Okay, um, what type of receptors are involved? The type of receptors at the heart are the beta adrenergic receptors. You already knew that. Also, um, this should get us back to understanding why, for instance, somebody would administer epi um, in a clinical situation in which the blood pressure is really dropped. Like perhaps I um, am going into shock because of an allergic response that causes massive vasodilation. So you can administer epi, and epi actually helps you three different ways because epi will cause an increase in heart rate and that'll bump up your pressure, but an increase in stroke volume and that'll bump up your pressure. But it also causes sympathetic stimulation with arterioles um, to give you more pressure because you've got body-wide constriction to bump up the pressure. So epi really helps you with falling blood pressure in three different ways, heart rate, stroke volume, and vasoconstriction, okay? And of course, you know that epi can be administered clinically for like um, anaphylactic shock. Um, okay. But what if you had the other problem? Part of the medullary cardiovascular control center is actually attached to the parasympathetic nervous system via the vagus nerve. Um, and this is sometimes called the cardioinhibitory center because parasympathetic. And what that does is sends an action potential to the parasympathetic neurons via the vagus nerve, goes to the SA node and the AV node, even though AV isn't shown in this picture. And then parasympathetic neurons, you guys know, parasympathetic postganglionic neurons secrete the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, right? And acetylcholine um, impacts heart rate, but it doesn't have a direct impact on stroke volume because the parasympathetic nervous system is not hooked up to the ventricular myocardium, to the wall, so it can't impact, um, uh, it can't impact ventricular contractility. And then do you remember what type of receptors are involved? The type of receptors that are involved are cholinergic receptors. Okay. And <clears throat> so um, normally in non-tiger, non-fight or flight situations, um, parasympathetic innervation will dominate. So um, because your heart... Um, beats about at rest 70, 75 times per minute, um, the parasympathetic nervous system is always slowing it down from what it could be doing. And we kind of drew something like this last time. Remember, so this is your heart when um, nothing is stimulating it. If you increase parasympathetic stimulation, you get fewer contractions per time period. If you increase sympathetic stimulation, you get more contractions per time period. So um, normally parasympathetic stimulation is dominating. So right now my heart rate is below 100 beats per minute, even though my SA node depolarizes 100 times per minute because the parasympathetic nervous system is kind of keeping its foot on the brakes. <clears throat> so if you cut all of the innervation to a heart, the rate goes about 100 beats per minute. So the autonomic nervous system regulation, whether you turn on sympathetic or parasympathetic, um, <clears throat> is not just determined by whether there's a tiger in the room or not, or whether you're exercising or not. There are other things that you are constantly monitoring, including monitoring your own blood pressure to figure out whether you should turn on the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. And you also monitor the chemical content of your blood to figure out whether you should turn on the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system. And I'll get back to that in just a little bit. Okay, um, last little tidbit about heart is the other th ways that heart rate is controlled. Oh, let's go back to this for just a second. You're not gonna like this part because it like looks really confusing. 
So the rate of depolarization in the pacemaker cells is really controlled by sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. Come on, let me go over. There we go. Okay, which is the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic um, innervation will increase the rate of depolarization, and that increases heart rate. But the parasympathetic innervation decreases the rate of depolarization, and that impacts heart rate. But also the adrenal medulla epinephrine will do the same thing, whether if it gets there, not um, neurotransmitter, but as a hormone. So now that is one way that you can do a hormonal, hormonal control, but another way is thyroid hormone. Um, so let's look at hormonal control of heart rate, which we've been looking at right here anyway. So epi, uh, obviously, as a hormone, um, where is epi secreted from hormonal epi? The adrenal medulla, yeah? During sympathetic stimulation. And we know um, epi, um, hormonal epi, increases both heart rate and strength of contraction because epi and norepi both will impact um, the, um, not only the SA node and the AV node, but also the wall of the ventricle. But then in addition, um, we also have one other hormone. It doesn't have a dramatic impact on heart rate, but it cer certainly can have a lasting impact on heart rate. And that is your thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Um, T3 and T4 will increase the metabolic rate of all tissues, including the heart. So <clears throat> just so you know, we don't use this as a regulatory mechanism, but if a person who, if a person is hyperthyroid, like Graves disease, and it's not being treated, expect for that person's resting heart rate to be a little higher than other people's. If a person is hypothyroid, um, then expect their heart rate to be a little slower. So the increase of um, the hormone causes an increase of the heart rate. The effect is um, longer duration, but not dramatic. So epi you use as a regulatory mechanism to specifically increase heart rate. But thyroid hormone, just too much or too little can impact your heart rate. So other things not on this figure that actually influence heart rate. Temperature, since the whole... Um, Pacemaker cells depend on diffusion to start, diffusion of sodium and calcium. Um, then diffusion happens faster at higher temperatures. So increased body, body temperature, increased depolarization rate, and therefore increased heart rate, decreased body temperature, decreased heart rate. But if you, like, for instance, drown in a cold pool versus a warm pool, um, like, icy versus relatively warm. Um, not only does um, the cold decrease your heart rate, but it also decreases the oxygen requirements of the tissues. So you've probably heard that you're a bit more likely to survive being without oxygen in colder temperatures. For instance, if you drowned in a cold pool, you're a little more likely to survive than drowning in a warm pool. Now, of course, what other kinds of things can impact the autonomic nervous system? Well, the autonomic nervous system can, of course, be impacted by, um, come on, by um, emotions and those kinds of things. And then we'll get to these in just a minute. Chemoreceptor and baroreceptor reflexes. Okay, so, hold on. All right, so emotions can impact heart rate via the autonomic nervous system also because emotions can cause stress hormones to be released. And then um, if your ions are not normal, pr particularly sodium, potassium and calcium, then those can impact heart rate. Remember, we talked about hypokalemia and hyperkalemia causing problems with um, regularity of heart rates or repolarization. And then the thing that endurance training does is endurance training ends up making it so that your stroke volume gets really high because the contra contractility of the heart, the ability to really push out blood goes up really dramatically. So your resting heart rate can go down really dramatically and not actually impact cardiac output or blood flow negatively. So for instance, um, Lance Armstrong in his prime, his stroke volume was almost three times what a normal stroke volume was. And so his heart rate could be about 37 beats per minute. Um, 
and that was at rest and his blood flow was still maintained. But it isn't as if his heart rate couldn't go up to 150, 180, it could. He just had all of that cardiac reserve that a lot of us don't because of course he did that massive amounts of endurance training. All right, so um, we'll do clinical connections and then we'll stop with this part. So clinical connections, the whole concept of like congestive heart failure is a really interesting one. So um, what happens with congestive heart failure, also abbreviated CHF, is let's say the left heart or the right heart is weakened in the wall and it could be because of a heart attack or it could be because of um, increased pressure in the afterload. So what happens is um, that will decrease the cardiac output and therefore decrease circulation. So if your heart is weak, right, your stroke volume is going to go down. And what happens is um, the venous return back to the heart is not really directly dependent on what the ventricles do. So for instance, the blood will continue coming back in the superior and inferior vena cavi and in the pulmonary veins, even if the ventricles cannot keep up with putting it out. So what happens is you will end up with a backup, like a traffic jam. So if your left heart is weak, I want you to think about where it's going to back up until it gets to capillaries. Or if your right heart is weak, where is it going to back up? So think not about where the ventricle is trying to send it, but where it's coming from, the capillary bed that it's coming from. So what ends up happening with congestive heart failure is you end up retaining fluid and developing edema because you're going to back it up to the capillaries that were feeding that side of the heart and then it's going to leak out of the capillaries and you can get edema. So if you were talking about the left heart, so let's go left heart. So the left, um, the blood in the left ventricle, let's say the left ventricle is weak for whatever reason came from, of course, the left atrium. And then if you track it back from the left atrium until you get to a capillary bed, you're going to end up in the pulmonary capillary beds. So what continues to happen is the blood goes through the pulmonary capillary beds and into the pulmonary veins and then gets returned to the left atrium. Then it gets in the left ventricle, but the left ventricle is too weak to get it out. And so it starts backing up. It's a traffic jam. So failure of the left heart causes pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema, especially when lying down, lots of short shortness of breath associated with it. Potentially you can get um, fluid that's pushed into your lungs as well. Whereas the failure of the right heart, again, on the right heart, you're going to back up. So if the right heart was weak, let's back it up until we get to capillary beds. Back up from the right ventricle to the right atrium, which you can't really see in this picture, to the right atrium. And then back into systemic venous flow and then back into the systemic capillaries, okay? including the capillaries that have the most trouble getting blood back anyway because they're low pressure, they're far from the heart, they're going against gravity. So what happens with failure of the right heart is that you back up into all of your systemic capillaries, but where you're really going to notice it is what we call peripheral congestion. You're going to get swollen feet even in the morning, sometimes swollen hands, even when you haven't eaten a one pound bag of Cheetos the night before. So what do they do? for congestive heart failure. Well, you can use medications that strip some of the fluid, like a diuretic. You can see how that might help with the backup of flow, eliminate excess sodium and excess water, make you pee more, drop your blood pressure that way. You can use vasodilators, which um, sort of allow blood to um, get out of the ventricles better because you're reducing afterload. Or you can use a medication that I have been on before called digitalis, which is actually derived from the foxglove plant. And what digitalis does is it slows down your heart beat so that it fills really maximally, but then when it contracts, it contracts maximally. So it's basically more filling time, stronger contraction, more filling time, stronger contraction, okay? So it really kind of controls your heart rate and filling time and also strength of contraction, and that's digitalis. So um, that's that for that one.